Hello and welcome to Badger Talks Quick Picks, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Emily Whitgren from Detroit, Michigan, and I am a senior studying political science with certificates in business and public policy through the College of Letters and Science, the Wisconsin School of Business, and La Follette School of Public Policy. I'm pleased to introduce Doug Bradley, Distinguished Lecturer Emeritus. Today, Doug will point out how writing has helped many veterans to recover from their wartime experiences, specifically as the author of three books grounded in the Vietnam experience and was one of the founding members of the Deadly Writers Patrol magazine. He will demonstrate how writing has helped veterans to return to themselves, their families, and their communities. Doug Bradley has worked for the UW for three decades, is a veteran of the Vietnam War, and has written three books, Daros Vietnam, Dispatches from the Air-Conditioned Jungle, and co-authored with Professor Craig Warner, We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War, which was named Best Music Book of 2015 by Rolling Stone Magazine. He and Dr. Warner co-taught a very popular class at UW-Madison on the music of the Vietnam War. His new book, Who Will Stop the Rain, Respect, Remembrance, and Reconciliation in Post-Vietnam America, was released in December of 2019. Please welcome Doug Bradley. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Bradley. And I want to extend a very special Veterans Day 2023 greeting to my fellow veterans. To them, I say, welcome home. I'm speaking to you today from the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in downtown Madison. I encourage you to visit the museum when you can. If you have an opportunity right across the street from the state capitol, it's a really special Wisconsin treasure. Trust me, if you get here, you won't be disappointed. Behind me, you can, what you can see is a UH-1 Iroquois helicopter, commonly referred to as a Huey. This is the kind of chopper that transported me up and down Vietnam during my 365 days when I served there in 1970 and 1971. The gentleman you see here is my father, Jack Bradley, when he was stationed at nearby Truax Field during World War II. My dad served in the Army Air Force as a radio operator in the Pacific from 1944 to 46, spending his last six months as part of the occupying army in Japan. But he never talked about his experience in World War II, claiming, quote, I didn't do anything heroic. But as the Argentinian writer Jose Narosky has reminded us, reminded us, in war, there are no unwounded soldiers. Writing is one way we can heal those wounds. For me, words and writing have been at the core of my existence. Before I was a soldier, the two years when I was a soldier, and my 52 years as a veteran, I've devoted my life to listening to the voices of our veterans, distilling their memories, collecting and sharing their words, some of which I'm gonna share with you today. Let me give you a couple examples. When I arrived in Madison in 1974, a lot of Vietnam vets weren't welcomed home, weren't getting the kind of support they needed. So we started an organization called Vets House, which eventually morphed into what became the Vet Center nationally. And when we were there at the Vet Center working with the vets, we realized that maybe uh, they needed to talk, they needed to write, they needed to exercise, whatever it was they needed to get back. Writing became one of the ways through. So we started the writing group. We called ourselves the Deadly writer's patrol. And eventually, after we had enough sessions and guys were writing either a poem or a memoir, a short story, a novel, flash fiction. And for 15 years, we published 17 editions at our own cost, at our own effort of this magazine, which I'm happy to say is now available through the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. I'm just going to give you one example of a piece that was included in there. It was written by a wonderful Vietnam vet, a friend of ours named Gerald McCarthy, who served in July in 1966 and 1967. Now when you look up, it seems as if that light were moving toward the line of wild turkeys, feeding on juniper and bear berries, near the entrance to what the locals call the Other Arlington, a hillside cemetery off the old King's Highway. If you listen, you can hear the soft clucking sounds they make. Today in the glare of the supermarket light, they don't move much in there, he says. They're stunned, I tell them, their claws taped up, waiting. Outside in the late March dusk, 
a cold rain on stone. You think of them trapped in their tanks or hospital beds. Thank you, Gerald. Great work. I had my own processing and writing to do. I was in the rear in Vietnam, 365 days, 1970 and 1971. Um, it was a different war in those years. And I had to figure out my own story to tell. It took me 40 years to write it. And it finally became a collection of short stories. I called Deros Vietnam. Deros stands for date eligible for return from overseas. Subtitled Dispatches from the Air Conditioned Jungle. When I completed the collection, my publisher said, well, you know, you need an introduction and you need acknowledgements. Where it's for the last two things I wrote. So I'm just going to share with you briefly each of those pieces from Deros Vietnam. Introduction, the air conditioned war. I spent 365 days in Vietnam from November of 1970 to November of 1971. I worked in a corporate S shine and polish public information office and the US Army's headquarters at Longbin, a former rubber plantation about 15 miles from Saigon. I ended up there after my graduate from 1869 and not at law school at Boston University where I'd been accepted is a question I still ask myself. Well, I think the answer has something to do with Nixon, the draft, Vietnamization, my birthday and bad luck. I've more or less given up trying to figure it out. The reality is I didn't go to law school and I did get drafted. Vietnam became my real graduate school, my true education, if you will. And it's something that continues to teach me a lesson every day of my life. Now a brief piece from the acknowledgements. With all due respect to Charles Dickens, Vietnam was the worst of the best of times and the best of the worst of times. The best of Vietnam resided in the men and women I served alongside. Their friendship, resilience, courage, and good humor helped make the best of a horrendous situation. In the process, they helped me to cope with my 365 days in country. I wish I could thank them all individually now and wish like hell I thanked them back then. The worst was what it was, an unpopular, unwinning, at least from my vantage point, unforgiving war that sucked the life out of us, our families, and our country. America hasn't been the same since Vietnam and probably never will recover unless we confront everything that it did to us, especially the us who surrendered the best of our youth to the war's perpetration. Yet the best and the worst and everything in between can never be erased from our memories. My year in Vietnam changed me in my life. In the day goes by that where I don't reflect on that place, those people, us and them, that time and those experiences. And the only way I've ever been able to make any sense of it, if there is any sense to be made, is to write about it. Another example, we gotta get out of this place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War. As I mentioned, people were still having a difficult time talking about their experience, coming home, in fact, in ways that they needed to get here. And so several Vietnam vets that we met with and talked to still couldn't talk about the experience. We asked them about a song, the floodgates opened. They would start to talk about music, the music that brought them back. One of the guys that spoke to us in that, Moses Mora, he's Mexican and Native American. He served them in the Central Highlands from 1968 to 1969. His is a life lived and defined by music. But his survival came through storytelling and ritual, as he told us, and we got to get out of this place. Moses. I was born in 1949. The 1950s were my formative years and the 60s, my teenage years. I was experiencing live the dance craze era, early soul, surf music, the British invasion, and the American musical response as it was happening. By the time I graduated from high school in the summer of love, 1967, my soul had been psychedelicized as the Chambers Brothers brothers cleverly sang. That summer, I had seen live Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappa, and the Mothers of Invention, Country Joe and the Fish, and more. I didn't go to college. I went to record stores. Flipping through albums in record shops was therapeutic for an angst-filled kid from Vietnam going to Vietnam in those wonder days and years of the 60s. I was drafted in the Army, sent to Fort Ord, and eventually landed in Vietnam. 
There I hung out with the hipsters from Baltimore, Philly, LA, San Francisco. They were listening to James Brown and Curtis Mayfield on, made it, Curtis Mayfield on the real to real tape decks. So was I. We went into the war. None of us was going ho. Music kept us alive. I survived the Vietnam War. I did what I was told to do. I followed orders and I came out with an honorable discharge. I did not do so well after the war. I was damaged goods when I came back. Fortunately, I met a Lakota medicine man, Archie Fire Lame Deer, who took me under his wing and got me to participate in Native American spiritual ceremonies. Foremost was the sweat lodge. For the troubled person, veteran or not, the ceremony is a godsend. It keeps you balanced, upright, centered. The ceremonies are not only for the troubled soul, they are also a wonderful place to give thanks for the many blessings that come our way. Sometimes we have ceremonies just for veterans, the men and women who served. There's a variation called the wash away ceremony. It's an old traditional one for warriors upon their return from battle. It's for anyone who feels responsible for taking a life. A person covers their body with charcoal completely, then enters the sweat lodge where prayers, heat and steam, and especially songs, wash away any negative or remorseful feelings regarding the actions of battle. You're telling us about music for we gotta get out of this place. He told us a lot about his soul and getting back home. One more example, who'll stop the rain? Another piece I wrote after we gotta get out of this place, which was about the reaction we got to the book. And this was one of the reactions I got from a wonderful woman. The very first time I entered the USO information office in November 71, 70, I encountered a pretty petite, she's in the middle there, and smiley Vietnamese woman who worked as a secretary receptionist in our office. She smiled at me, said good morning, introduced herself as Ko Mai, that's Miss Mai in English. Thus began our year-long friendship. She was more than just window dressing in a drab army office in the heart of Southeast Asia. Miss Mai was sunshine and hope and promise to us scared homesick GIs. During the most difficult days of our 365 day Vietnam tour, Miss Mai was often the only light in an otherwise very dark tunnel. But after we left Vietnam again to watch the North Vietnamese take over the rest of the country, we all agreed Miss Mai would never get out of Vietnam alive. Here is part of her story that she shared in Who'll Stop the Rain. In early April 1975, I and many other South Vietnamese who worked for the U.S. Army were given top secret briefings about the American evacu evacuation plans. The North Vietnamese Army was bearing down on South Vietnam, and I was a marked woman because of my many years of service to the U.S. military. But our commanding officer promised us we would be able to get out of the country with our spouses and children when the time came to leave. But as a single mother, I had recently adopted my cousin's two-year-old daughter. I wanted my whole family, mommy and daddy and nine siblings, to be able to leave. The Army told me that since I did not have a husband, I could evacuate only with my young child. But I made it out, and I knew I would see my good friends, cousin Bradley and Uncle George again, George on the left, me on the right. Cousin Bradley, do you remember why I called you cousin and George uncle? Because we have agreed that with each other, we are family, brothers and sisters. So my children, they can relate to you as family. I call you cousin and uncle just for my children. Raised as a Buddhist, I have a strong belief in cause and effect. You and George are part of that, part of the good that came out of that ugly war. We will always owe one another person, we will always owe another person something, even if it's just understanding and appreciating what they've been through. There's an old Buddhist saying that sums this up, everything that we've been through. Quote, reconciliation is to understand both sides, to go to one side and describe the suffering being endured by the other side, and then go to the other side and describe the suffering being endured by the first side. I'll leave you today at the wall in Washington, DC, and the words of the wonderful poet Yusuf Kumanyaka, 
who at the time, his name was James Brown, another James Brown, changed his name to Yusef Kumanyaka. He was a Marine reporter during the war. He wrote this amazing poem called Facing It. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't, damn it. No tears. I'm stone. I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me like a bird of prey, the profile of night slanted against morning. I turn this way. The stone lets me go. I turn that way. I'm inside the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down to 58,318 names, half expecting to find my own in letters like smoke. I touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby traps white flash. Names shimmer on a woman's blouse, but when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Brush strokes flash, a red bird's wings cutting across my stare. The sky, a plane in the sky. A white vet's image floats closer to me, then his pale eyes look through mine. I'm a window. He's lost his right arm inside the stone. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. Welcome home. Happy Veterans Day.